Andy. All right, let's do it. Uh, okay. Welcome to New York Augmented Reality. We'll just go right into it. We have a packed event tonight. I want to make sure everyone gets the uh, proper time. So uh, we worked really hard on putting the event together and it's amazing to have you back. It's good to have David Rose back, uh, previously joining from Clearwater and now he's uh, here to show off his book, uh, Super Sight. We have Alex Harity, um, uh, Connor Bell, uh, Donna, uh, Shermesh and Alone Grinchmoon all here with us tonight. So it's uh, really exciting that everyone has joined us. Uh, last week was the one year birthday of New York Augmented Reality. And uh, we we're really excited about that. Um, this past year, we did a bunch of things to help the community. We set up a Slack channel to stay connected with folks in the uh, AR community outside of the meetup. So if you'd like to join, scan the QR code. Usually it's just me posting links, um, but it seems to work. Nevertheless, we have a weekly newsletter called the Augmented Report. Uh, we'll put links as well in the chat, but the augmented report is uh, highlights the latest news, top apps and events. Uh, a lot of the speakers here tonight were featured in this newsletter in the past. So you could join by scanning the QR code if you'd like. I think you might find some of the information useful. Um, and we continue to host meetups and they've been great. And we have 970 members now, almost a thousand, which is really exciting. And we've had over 15 events and more than 60 speakers from across the industry. It's been an amazing year. Um, and in the year ahead, we hope to host in-person events. We think they'll be an amazing way to continue growing our community and connect with others. And we're gonna host more workshops and live demos. We've had that requested by a lot of members in the group. So look out for that. We've had one uh, with Alex Brat from Mousepack. And we also did a really cool uh, art gallery on Spatial with Fabin Rashid, a previous speaker. So uh, keep in touch and uh, check out some cool events we have in the future. Um, and then lastly, the job board. Um, people are looking for new ways to connect with companies. So members are looking for uh, jobs and companies are looking for uh, group members. So we're looking for different ways to help bridge this gap. So hopefully within the next year, we could uh, uh, continue to grow the augmented reality community. And now I want to take a moment to thank Barry Seth, the co-organizer of the meetup. Barry, please. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I don't have any prepared remarks, but you're welcome to contact me as well for any connections, linkages, things like that. I will try to put you in touch with people in my, in my network as well, Andy. Thank you so much for joining. We look forward to meeting you in person at a physical meetup soon. Awesome. And we're thinking January, February, we're speaking to a bunch of different venues to make it happen. So uh, stay tuned. We'll keep you posted. Since it's been about a month, I want to take a moment to highlight this past month in augmented reality for this month's month in review. So today, or last time we met for an evening meetup was October 18th and what's happened since then. So uh, Snap announced Arcadia, which is a creative studio for branded AR experiences. It's going to function as a subsidiary of Snap, so it won't be part of Snapchat or any of the companies that you're currently familiar with. Um, but they'll be able to create branded experiences, platform agnostic, so they'll work in and outside of Snapchat, which is very exciting. Um, and then to announce this platform, they did this uh, launch in Hudson Yards called, they took over uh, Shake Shack and created the Snap Shack, which uh, showcased some of their capabilities as a creative studio. So that was cool. Um, this is a cool app called Zero Ten that I found while uh, working on one of the newsletters. So it's an AR fashion app. You could scan to download it. It's pretty cool for uh, purchasing and, and it uses AR kit to uh, try on digital goods. Um, if you need any links after, just feel free to reach out to me. But I think they did a really nice job of, of putting this app together. Facebook, if you haven't heard, renamed itself to Meta, which is good. And although they didn't reach uh, release any new headsets, they mentioned upcoming project Cambria, which is a 
VR headset with colored pass-through. Currently, it's just black and white pass-through. So um, this new headset, which has yet to be released, will make the VR experience even stronger. And as you can see in the video above, Project Nazaire, their first full-fledged AR device. Um, they admitted it will be a long time till it comes to fruition, but they're uh, making good steps to getting there. DigiLens is a waveguide holographic company for the hardware folks in the audience, and they're now valued at $500 million after uh, Samsung and uh, others invested in their Series B rounds. That's DigiLens. Uh, Roni Abovitz released a preview of his short film. That's featured on New York Augmented Reality. Yep, and that was featured. Pikmin Bloom is now available for iOS, as well as Niantic's ARDK, which allows you to create an app like Pikmin Bloom. So that happened in the middle of the month. Um, Eternals, I know there's a lot here. I'm just going to fly through it, I guess, because a lot happened this past month. But Marvel Eternals, great AR app. Check it out as well. If you need the link, reach out to me after. On November 8th, we had the New York Augmented Reality Excellent Daytime Meetup with Link, Sequoia Games, and Metal Grass. And then on November 9th, the infamous David Rose released this fantastic book, Super Sight. And I'm honored to have David Rose here with us tonight to introduce the book. Thank All you. right. Thanks so much, Andy. Uh, I thought I would show you a little bit about uh, what's inside. So here it is. It looks really easy to write uh, at this at this altitude. Um, I'm here with Kyle Sharp, who helped me create an app that goes along with the book. Uh, the book kind of asked the question of like, what are the essential benefits of this next evolution and how we see? Um, and the chapters cover uh, Kind of knowing the name of everything, a new kind of metaphor of coaching for uh, what's possible with subjective neural nets, uh, food, education, uh, the gamification collide of, of the world, of the work world, um, a healthcare chapter, a chapter on industrial, and a chapter on what, what should we actually be doing with this technology in order to really help people solve a crisis of imagination problem. And we talked, and actually Kyle and I worked on a envisioning a sustainable landscapes project before, uh, before we worked on this app. So that's all inside. Um, and uh, I just wanted to show you a couple of things that the app does, because you know, I kind of got to ask this, this, this question of what in the world should we do with, you know, uh, with augmenting print? Uh, so if you click on the AR app, uh, it allows you to scan up to 80 things inside the book. Um, obviously, the like you want the book to be color. So yes, it's color. You want there to be um, videos of how the how different uh, uh, apps work uh, that that I talk about. So there's there are these little cute little sidebars which are all image anchors. I also put a bunch of frameworks in the book and then kind of chalk talk through. Um, you know, building those frameworks as if I was at a whiteboard saying like, this is the vertical axis and this describes how feedback might be richer or less rich in coaching and in, in coaching applications or whether those are expensive or less expensive and what do we see out there from form and tonal and tempo and other kind of AR things and what should the big brands be doing. Um, and then drilling into like, this is what mirror is, blah, blah, blah. So also there's some uh, animation, some kind of cut paper animations at the in beginning of each chapter where I offer like a short intro to what's covered in that chapter as a voiceover. Um, and <clears throat> I'd, I'd love people's feedback on, for color photos, we decided to do this kind of uh, shadow box effect. So rather than just blasting up the, uh, blasting up the color version, we have you kind of looking through this little portal uh, where the color, the color is photo is bent behind and you can and you can kind of peer in and peer through. It's kind of a nice effect. Um, and of course they're Easter eggs. So like things that don't have the AR icon next to them, but can play 
a bit of the Simpsons where they talk about VR historical sins. So the the other thing that seems like it could be use could be useful for uh, authors with, with AR is basically publishing the book before you finish the book. Um, so I, I proposed some design principles near the end of the book, and I wasn't really done with it. So I thought, oh, why not like have a magic ink effect so I don't have to finish the design principles before actually publishing the book. So that's that's there. Um, but the design principles are also in a Miro board, which is on supersite.world. Uh, so you can zoom in and kind of use use and uh, take the design principles as a presentation. There's a poster I made that goes with the book. Uh, there's a layout of the manuscript, links to tools, that kind of stuff in the book. But I guess the question for all of you, and maybe you can do it in the chat, is what else would you do with AR over the book medium? Um, we made a little thing so you can share movies if you're like inspired by something. Um, I'd love an API from Kindle that kind of shows you what do people highlight in the Kindle book. Um, and I'm a little bit obsessed right now with, for, with prediction markets to try to answer hard technical questions, not just about when things will be viable or affordable or um, that you could put the question up on a prediction market and then have people take bets on either side of that, kind of like what predictit.org uh, does. Any other thoughts? in the chat for what we should do with, with uh, AR over print. Looks like uh, Chris likes the portal effect with the images and he said it would be nice to be able to zoom in so you could see the colored one full screen as well. Oh yeah. Yeah, we actually tried, uh, maybe Kyle can speak to this, but we, we tried to have it so that once you got past a threshold it would become full screen, but people didn't really expect that. And we found it to be uh, a little bit uh, fussy, I guess, when we were testing it. Yeah, <clears throat> so it came down to, it came down to uh, the, the, the finicky of the, the finickiness of the AR camera and the, the movement of the, um, the, the targets um, as you're kind of shifting left, right and moving forward. But the idea was essentially you move close enough and the portal sort of consumes you and then you're just you're just seeing all black around you and then the um the print screen it worked pretty well but there were definitely some scenarios where um if the user wasn't fully comfortable with ar um getting sort of in and out of that state uh wasn't uh wasn't perfect so uh, if we had more time definitely i, I would have kept that in there but Awesome. Is this uh, is this available publicly, David? I see you have uh, like a Miro board up. With yeah, there's the... a yeah, there's a Miro board um, on the site. So oh. like that has the design principles, and you can make it full screen. And like this is chapter one and chap I, the intro and the and the conclusion um, of the book is here. Awesome. Um, uh, awesome. And then there are a bunch of projects that that. Uh, Great. That... And uh, Donna said she ordered the book, and Tom wants you to post the Miro URL. So if you could share that, that'd be great. Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Awesome. And I don't think I have any reviews on Amazon. So if somebody's willing to review it, that would be awesome. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, David, I appreciate cool. you hopping on. Thanks everybody. Cool. All right, so to continue my uh, kind of long list of the latest news, let's see here, um, wow. So I don't know what happened there. Um, sorry, we should could skip ahead here. Uh, so thank you, David. Netflix introduced games, which is pretty cool as it might lead into mixed reality content in the future. Um, Disney also mentioned they're interested in AR content that will live within Disney Plus. So. I think Netflix releasing games uh, could have something to do uh, with their interest in mixed reality content in the future. So that will be really interesting. Unity acquired Weta for $1.625 billion, a small sum to uh, put them up against Epic in the race for best uh, render and visualization tool. So um, I think that was an amazing acquisition 
I try not to do personal comments here, but I'm, I'm excited to try out the different tools that uh, WET is going to offer. And then Peter Jackson the also era of creativity is, really, is releasing you know, something bigger than it's ever been before. Unity the Get Back, um, the Beatles Get Back documentary on, dis on November 25th. So um, if you want to see the Beatles movie by Peter Jackson, the founder of WETA, then check it that out. It's nothing to do with AR necessarily. Actually, it does. It's on Disney. It's on Disney Plus. Thank you, Barry. If that helps you, how is it? I, how does it have anything to do with AR? It Andy? does. It does. The reason he came up with the uh, the Beatles movie is because he called Apple the Beatles production company. The Beatles, not Apple, the technology company. Apple, the Beatles production company, and they were having a conversation around augmented reality, which then led to the Beatles get back from that conversation. Um, wow. I heard that 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 they didn't those tapes were sitting there for like fifty years and they just found them like two years ago. Correct. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Dispelix, a San Fran waveguide hardware company. They don't release a lot of information, these guys, but uh, they raised thirty-three million. Um, and then also an awesome AR art platform that's bridging the gap between NFTs and augmented reality, which is very needed because there's not really many ways to view NFTs right now was just released on the app store this past week. And it's one of the apps I'm most excited about. And I'm really uh, honored to have Alex Harity, the co-founder of Anima here with us tonight to introduce the app. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, just one, one minor correction, Andy, uh, noted on the chat. Uh, this Felix is out of Finland. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Hey everybody. Um, thanks, Andy. Well, hey, I'm gonna gonna keep it pretty brief today. So Andy asked if I would be well asked if I if I'd like to, and I and I, I really did want to give a, a brief introduction um, to Anima since we went out last week, um, and you know just give kind of a a quick overview of where we're at, um, kind of where we're coming from as a company, and, and also what we put out last last week, and what you'll see from us in the near future. But um, me and my co-founder's background is is more in the gaming world. I was speaking of Epic, I, was, I worked with Epic for uh, over two years on Fortnite and on the Epic Game Store and both on, on AR projects they had internally and, and some things related to UE. Um, and my co-founder started his career with Nintendo making 3D games and then um, later was lead design at Tumblr and sort of other creator communities. So the way we're approaching this is, um, you know, we, we really see AR as, you know, basically see Fortnite Roblox, Minecraft is sort of a uh, you know a signal that virtual goods are kind of as real to people as as physical goods, especially in the younger generation. But they're stuck inside game worlds, and AR is really an opportunity to ground that and bring that into the real world and make it shareable. Since we all communicate through camera as it is, the world is kind of its own platform. Anyway, I don't need to sell AR to this this group, fortunately. Um, but uh, the way we're the way we're approaching this is you know it, it's it's actually rather difficult to create and, and sell something in AR. Um, Web3 offers an opportunity for that. You know, there's, there's lots of artists who were interested in the medium, but um, hadn't made anything in AR or made anything digital because you know, there wasn't really a market for it necessarily. Um, now there is, and, and there's a way to guarantee, you know, guarantee authenticity and originality and royalties on resales. So at, at Anima, what we do is we work with artists to bring their work into AR. Um, and help them sell it as NFTs. Um, we don't take 3D objects and just drop them, um, you know, in Reality Composer and say that's AR. What we're really doing is um, enabling features that they would not have been able to have access to otherwise that are kind of, as I mentioned, rooted in game design. So things like location awareness and having uh, AR objects that change based off of where they're at and being able to combine multiple ones together. Um, in AR or having change based off of the color of the surface they're on or the time of the day or the phase of the moon. Um, so that's what Anima is, sort of part production studio right now, part um, platform that we're building on top of ARKit um, and part marketplace for these as well. Um, so I'll, I'll just give a quick example of what we put out last week. So one of the artists we're working with is a Spanish food artist named Jay Dembski. Um, if you haven't ever seen him before, it's really cool. It's just kind of retro futuristic style he has. You know, very much rooted in like arcade game design and stuff. Um, and one thing we really liked was he made these sort of physical sculptures um, 
that he called space navigators. You know, they're pretty wild. These are not AR, these are, these are actual sculptures. Um, and he was really, did a lot with locations. So he did an art show underwater. He released the coordinates for it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's pretty wacky, kind of futuristic alien looking stuff. Um, so we worked with him to make a digital version of that. Um, sorry, you're gonna hear like bedtime stuff in the background from my kids. Um, and uh, we, we basically took, took his 3D models, changed them, optimized them, made a few different versions of them. Um, you see it in web right here. Um, and you can check this out if you go to anima.supply um, on an iPhone, or you, really on anything, but on an iPhone, you'll be able to hop into AR. Um, and you can refresh this and um, you'll see different models as well. Um, and one thing we're doing that's a little unique is that we're using app clips for AR, which I think is like wildly underutilized. Um, so app clips are like lightweight apps. Um, we don't have to download a few ones. So I'm gonna show this live. Hopefully this works well. Um, so I don't have the Anima app downloaded right now. I get this kind of little banner up top um, and you can click view. And this is contextual based off of what I'm looking at. Um, so I'm looking at this one specific object um, it should pop. It's gonna need some permissions here. And it should pop right into AR here, yeah. So this one is gonna match whatever I was looking at on the web and I didn't have to download the app or anything. Um, you can download the app and it lets you do things like save the camera roll, but um, uh, this is, you know, the object in AR, we build this on top of AR kit. It, we, we do things like location detecting because these objects are gonna be released with a bunch of coordinates around the world. And if you um, place them at one of those coordinates, uh, they'll actually change. Um, we're not really telling people how, but they'll change visually and audibly and also on chain. The data itself will actually change on chain. Um, this little certificate you see on top of it reflects on chain data, who owns it right now, um, who created it, what edition number it is as well. Um, and, you know, if you, do, if you look through different objects on the web, um, that's the same one I got. But if you were to go to a different one, then it'll flip over and it'll change to, you know, whatever I'm looking at here. Um, they all look kind of similar right now, but that'll change over time. Um, so it's just just kind of a you know little example there of of what we're doing. Um, you know, if you, you you can also download our app just by looking at the uh, AR viewer. Um, but kind of the intersection between web and AR and sort of quickly going between the two um, is pretty seamless when you're using App Clip. So if you have if you're downloading on AR Kit and haven't haven't checked out App Clips, I'd, I'd certainly recommend it. Just you, you can do basically a lot of what you would do in apps. Um, with a much lighter payload as long as you're doing everything in the cloud. Um, but I'm probably at like my five minutes here. So I'll, I'll turn it over, over and uh, if anybody has any questions or um, wants to chat after, feel free to hit me up. We're hiring too. Thank you so much, Alex, for joining. If you have any uh, questions for Alex um, or you'd like to speak with him after, definitely uh, add him on LinkedIn. Um, just for the sake of time, I think we should move forward, but really appreciate you joining, Alex. It was great to have you on, and, and I really love the platform, so thank you. And that brings us to tonight's event, New York Augmented Reality, the evening meetup on November 22nd, and we're honored to have with us speakers from across the industry that in their own ways are pushing augmented reality forward and making what was once impossible possible. Um, first off, we have Donna Shermesh Roshev. She's an entrepreneur in residence at Schmidt Futures and the founder and CEO of In Situ, an augmented reality powered civic engagement app that democratizes city planning. She is an architect from Tel Aviv, Israel, and an urban data scientist from NYU CUSP. And she is a former F 15 an F-15L flight simulator trainer from the Israeli Air Force. That's pretty cool. And prior to becoming an EIR, uh, Dana was the director of urban data and, at, and innovation at Draw Brooklyn, an urban design studio in Red Hook, Brooklyn. She worked at the New York City Department of City Planning, DCP, conducting a data-driven analysis of regional planning. Her research on the feasibility of Tel Aviv's Rezoning was published in Haaretz newspaper, and she is a frequent lecturer on planning's next frontier. And we're excited to have uh, Donna here tonight to learn more about her app in situ. Hey, 
Thank you, uh, Andy, for this uh, uh, long introduction. Um, and my apologies in advance for any screamings you will hear in the background, because uh, evening time here is first uh, here too. So let's uh, just start. I will share my screen. Um, and thank you, everyone. It's really, really great to be here. So thanks for having me. Um, are we seeing in C2? Looks great. Good. OK, uh, amazing. So uh, as Andy said, in C2, augmented reality powered civic city planning. Um, in C2, the, the word is uh, a Latin phrase that means in the original place. Um, and as Andy said, I'm an architect uh, by practice, uh, moved to New York four and a half years ago to study urban data science and started working on in situ about two, two years ago. Um, so in situ democratizes the process of urban development in order to build better cities faster and equitably. The problem is city planning today is too cumbersome and inaccessible to ignite the quality and pace of urban renewal needed in an era of rapid urban changes. If we break the, the problem, the process is built on major distrust that result in opposition to any change. The process of urban development is skewed towards speculations and nimbism. NIMBY is not in my backyard if, uh, for this audience, uh, meaning basically opposing to any development anywhere. Projects are rejected or massively delayed, leaving poor neighborhoods uninvested, and cities worldwide uh, facing more and more severe housing shortage and become more unaffordable. Institute uh, solves these inefficiencies by simply bringing the future of cities into people's hands. Uh, our civic engagement app layers 3D models on top of the existing built environment uh, in order to easily communicate uh, what will be built um, in a very uh, integrated fashion into people's lives. How it works, people walk down the street, scan a QR code instead of uh, the two full of words planning notices that usually have been put behind trees. So we celebrate planning, uh, we want people to see urban change um, they scan the QR, they see um, everything that is going around their homes. They explore this proposal in AR, being very easily um, uh, able to understand what's the proposal. And through the project detail page, they learn more. And most importantly, they can um, raise their voice and comment and participate through the same platform, meaning they don't have any more to go to planning hearings or exhausting public meetings. Uh, they can just raise their uh, voice through the app. Uh, we collect their data to give a much more representative image of the public sentiment about developments in different geographic areas. Um, we aim to apply the smart engagement along the complete planning cycle from concept through approval, even to mar marketing, to really shorten uh, the planning cycle to save um, very valuable and uh, expensive time and money from every development. We sell to the real estate developers a uh, subscription model uh, for them to de-risk, improve, and speed up the process um, through this very uh, simple uh, and easy to use communication app. Uh, as said, we started two years ago in, in Red Hook, Brooklyn. Uh, We're incubated today in the Entrepreneur in Residence uh, program of Eric Schmidt uh, Social Impact Venture, Schmidt Futures. We launched our app uh, earlier this year in the spring uh, in a project in Midtown Manhattan, which is still available. So if you want to download the app, you're most welcome to go there and just see a proposal to relocate Madison Square Garden. Over the summer uh, and fall, we um, won one competition in Long Beach and got the first paying customer. Since then, won another competition in Colorado, and we will deploy in situ in, a, in Centennial City earlier, uh, early um, 2022. We just came back last week from um, the AWE, winning the Startup to Watch uh, Augie Award, and we are um, 
closing um, this month our pre-seed round uh, and just got the first money in over the weekend. So celebrating this. Um, the vision of Institu is that everywhere in the world, every construction under planning could be viewed in AR, as, simp as simple as that. Uh, we start from uh, the municipalities that have 50K residents and more, and specifically from the largest developments that can first bring the most opportunity to residents and developers and cities, but also have the biggest risk if they fail, uh, such as Amazon HQ2, Industry City in Sunset Park, if you know, uh, and others. Uh, we hope to, by that, uh, prove the value of this type of uh, tool in establishing a respectful conversation uh, and fruitful conversation about developments. Um, after 15, 20 of these um, big projects, we hope to become a new global standard. If today the standard is 2D renderings uh, for communicating planning, sorry for the yelling, um, AR should be the new global standard for how cities are being developed. Um, the social and economic impact of in situ uh, are going together. The more residents involved, the better alignment between residents and developers' motivation and needs, um, more intelligent and efficient planning and greater trust in city government. Um, to dive in a bit more to the, our first pilot in Manhattan earlier this year. So as said before, um, we uh, viewed in AR a proposal to relocate Madison Square. We worked back then uh, with Community Board 5, which is um, the authority for Midtown West. Um, they were concerned whether the proposal is blocking the view to Empire State. As you can see in two seconds, it aggressively uh, blocking the view to Empire State, but um, they were also curious to see how people react to this massive development using this type of visualization communication tool. What was pretty amazing, um, and we were there with this QR code and a um, bunch of volunteers, um, we collected data about people's uh, demographics and um, people's reactions to this again, massive development. What was interesting, even before diving into the data of who are the people, no one was angry. And I'm not sure this group is um, well scarred like me from um, yelling, uh, re yelling residents and angry residents. Uh, as an architect, I've presented not once uh, different developments and I've been yelled at. Um, people come to planning hearings and community meetings not to learn about development, they come to fight. And what we found is that after people literally held the future or this proposal in their hands and explored it on their own convenience, they came back just with questions. What will be the um, businesses uh, in the ground floor? Where does the housing start? What type of housing, etc.? Uh, and we truly, in the first day that we launched, we kind of validated the assumption that we can uh, actually establish a more respectful conversation. Um, in diversifying participation, we were pretty amazed too to find found out that many young people, mixed income, mixed education level, and maybe most excitingly, 72% renters uh, participated uh, in the process. Renters, as I guess most of you know, do not have really any representation in urban development. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and as said, we had two more pilots over the, the summer and we're uh, expecting to launch three big developments in Q1. Now for the exciting challenge that I'm announcing here today, um, we are launching now and until December 1st, a small but exciting challenge based on the new uh, light chip that Niantic just announced. Um, we will give uh, $3,000 in prize to the winner who will take 3D model um, and will put them using Unity and Lightship in one location and um, share this through iOS and Android. I will put in the chat, um, wait, a link to subscribe if you want in a minute. Um, and to end, why is this even important and why now? So we have a 
great political momentum with the uh, American Recovery Plan Act and the infrastructure bill. Um, many, many um, great money coming to state local governments for inclusive, equitable recovery. We do not take from this budget, but the political um, discourse resulting from this massive investment uh, in better society is getting into um, the private sector as well. And this is really great. As you all know, the technology is here. They are becoming uh, more and more ubiquitous um, and the tools just become better and better. And, and they just announced all of these very exciting um, new tools uh, and opportunities. Uh, and of course, most importantly, we cannot allow ourselves to have um, stagnated counterproductive and exclusive planning process anymore um, with climate change and public health um, uh, threats and uh, challenges. We must um, have give equip our cities with adaptive um, tools. Uh, and to end, we can and must transform a fight into a conversation. This is Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses. I don't know if you're familiar, but maybe two of the most important figures in the 60s that pretty much shaped New York City as all of us know, uh, know it. So uh, with this, I'll end. Thank you very much. You are mo more than welcome to download the app. It's iOS based, um, working on the Android. Uh, and yeah, thank you again. Uh, all for listening. That's awesome. Uh, amazing stuff. Thank you so much, Donna. Um, yeah, you brought up Robert Moses. I mean, he's obviously as a con little, little bit controversial, but uh, just as an observation, you probably know that they're thinking that, that this proposal of, of possibly enclosing that, I don't know, one to two mile stretch of 95 across Bonds Expressway, which is, yeah. has been attributed to high asthma rates. I mean, that would be amazing if it could be visualized and that would really help with that whole campaign. Okay. So, right away, so about this, have yes. you heard about um, Marvelous Order? It's an opera no. that um, they may basically put this story of Robert Moses and this specific fight with Jane Jacobs as an opera. Mm -hmm. uh, and wow. they, I think they will use AR to show it outside. It should be. Awesome was supposed to be. Yeah, I'll find and I'll put in the Slack because it's amazing. Um, if you I could, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I live in Westchester, but I've heard the whole stories about making the bridges too, too, too short so buses couldn't fit in to block people from lower or basically brown and, bl and black people from coming to the suburbs. So, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy, um, his legacy. But, um, okay, here's a question from David. Uh, could you take an A, B a testing approach, which is uh, thanks for clarifying, which means present multiple designs, I, I, I think is what the A and B testing means. Yes, definitely. We can toggle through different scenarios and we actually uh, encourage our clients to do so and to engage as early as possible. So just to get you in the midst of this, civic engagement is required along the process for approval in certain times uh, in the process. We try to kind of educate the sector uh, of urban development that um, just engage as early as possible, bring people on board, incorporate their feedback. It will, it's not just the right thing to do, it's also financially uh, the right thing to do. You will get faster approval with just better planning. So, yes. Oh, just great, quickly, cool. Quickly, Can Barry, good, uh, before you continue with the questions, <clears throat> um, Donna, uh, people are having trouble accessing the document with the permission setting, oh. so you could open it. Okay, that. I'll think. So I, I will uh, make sure it's uh, available right okay. when I start. Can I ask a quick, a quick follow-up question, Donna? Your your graph, your slides are so beautiful, um, <clears throat> and kind of have like a montage look. And I was wondering, is do you really want the visualizations of the buildings to be hyper realistic, or is it better to be kind of sketchy, abstracted? Um, so to me, I mean. As you, I guess, know, the technology is agnostic to whether it's realistic or not. Um, again, when I work with clients, I encourage them to not make it too realistic unless it's already the design is finalized. And then this is what the discussion is about. What is it, bricks or concrete? But if not, don't go there. Like, don't make it like your Photoshop rendering. This is because you will just confuse people. So it should be... Um, tangible enough for people to understand the mass, the uses, but uh, abstract enough for them not to worry about where the balconies are before you even 
design that. Um, so yeah, that's definitely where we are. Okay, another question about, can this technology be used for indoor spaces, you know, such as, you know, all these old malls that are sitting throughout uh, the US and probably globally that are, that, I mean, I was thinking just during lockdowns, I mean, they could have been used for public recreation during the winters when we were stuck in our houses. Even if you live in the suburbs, you might not want it to go outside. So if, if these places could have been, been used for more uh, recreation, like uh, indoor parks and play areas for kids, for adults, for, for everyone really, um, as well as uh, all these big box stores that, are, that have gone um, you know, out of, into disrepair and such. Um, I mean, it could, but that's not where uh, our focus uh, is. I believe there are more um, tools out there for um, indoors AR. Uh, we try to put the fo focus on two things. First, on the very accurate and uh, available to all geo-anchoring. So anyone from mm -hmm. anywhere can see one thing in the exact place. And second, on the engagement, which is not the AR, but just all the crowdsource people's input uh, and such. We truly care about democratizing the planning process, so it's less um, for the indoors. Although, I mean, it's an amazing experience what you just described. Cool. Yeah, just an idea that, well, that was kind of my question and Andy's oh, combined. So um, there's a question from uh, Caitlin. Thank you, Caitlin. She's a future speaker coming soon. Thank you so much for joining. Is there a larger mission associated with the contest, uh, such as uh, collaborative games, et cetera? Can you repeat? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Is yeah. there a larger mission oh. associated with the contest that you were talking about, such as uh, some collaborative game or something related to, to that? Um, I guess one day, yes, like we would want to create this as an interactive so people can also on the AR um, maybe suggest or propose things. Um, so definitely, yes, uh, we're still at the very early stages. So uh, we're not, the product is not there yet, but uh, that's definitely where our head uh, is at. Awesome. So much potential. Cool. Great. Well, uh, please send your links in the chat or send it to me and I'll put it out there. Yes, and we'll uh, we look forward to to hearing more so my daughter is actually in israel because andy doesn't like me like me to tell about that but my daughter is in at bar Ilan university currently oh, wow. so you know we definitely have an israel connection cool yeah. thank you so much uh for that we look forward to thank hearing you more. all thank you for bearing the yelling around no no problem yeah the yelling attitude it was great and uh, awesome app and i can't wait to try it out soon and um for sure, I'll look into this light chip challenge and I put it in the Slack as well so um, the community could join. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, Donna. Next, we have uh, with us, we're lucky to have with us Connor Bell, a graphics programmer and multidisciplinary artist from Nova Scotia. And he's now based in Montreal. He generates uh, he creates really, uh, really cool generative and interactive artworks with code and integrates them into emerging mixed reality mediums, um, of which we'll be learning more about tonight. So thank you, Connor, for joining us. Thanks, Andy, for having me. Thank you for the introduction. Let me share my screen now. Uh, can you see it? Um, I guess it's still loading, but... Um... Yep. You see it now? Looks great. Okay, cool. Uh, so hi everyone, my name is Connor. Um, I'm working on a new experimental renderer for LiDAR enabled iOS devices uh, using Metal AR kit and maybe Steam kit soon, but um, we'll get to that a bit later. Um, but this renderer, as opposed to rendering mesh based objects, like um, something you'd find in reality kit or something, this uh, renders a type of surface called the signed distance function, which is um, a surface that I've been experimenting a lot with my artwork for the past few years. Uh, it's, um, I write brain markers for the graphics card that are like under 200 lines of code. A lot of inspiration is taken from the demo scene, which uh, creates um, executables that are like less than four kilobytes of code. 
And I like to create a lot, just looping GIFs because they're, I challenge myself to actually like produce content quickly as it was, I found myself over scoping things. So I started making uh, one second loops. <laughs> so that forced me to complete everything uh, that I wanted to. And the things that stood out the most, I adapted into larger context. Uh, specifically um, this one in VR uh, that I made with Unity, Oculus, and Leap Motion. So it does hand tracking with gestures and uh, pinch controls so you can conduct the parameters of the generative fractal. And in this one also made in Unity, it's a networked uh, multiplayer prototype uh, where you're inside of a fractal while touching a fractal. And when you look up, you realize that the fractal that you're touching is also the one that you're inside. So you see how your uh, hands are affecting <laughs> the environment that you're in. Uh, that one was kind of fun, unfortunately it wasn't released. Um, but this is the AR app that I'm working on now. Uh, it starts off by you just pointing your device at where you want to place the object. And then you can select between the distance functions and each of the distance functions have their own set of parameters that are automatically loaded into the UI. And then on the right hand side of the screen, there's the uh, controls where you can rotate, scale, and move around the space. And it's pretty rudimentary, but uh, it's good enough for setting up basic scenes where I just want to capture it and see how, how it looks. And this is all a uh, prototype UI, uh, if you can tell, uh, it's pretty embarrassing. This is like, I posted a few videos of uh, this project uh, a week or two ago and it went kind of viral um, and it, it's still at a prototype stage. So it feels kind of preemptive talking about it right now, but um, really happy to show what I have so far. And or, in order to appreciate the, what this renderer is actually doing, uh, you kind of have to understand what a conventional 3D mesh is stored as geometry, there's a bunch of vertices, there's all of the triangles that compose the mesh. They can be very large in file size depending on the detail and the scale of them. Sign distance fields, on the other hand, are just pieces of code. Um, they're functions that evaluate a position in space. So, um, and the position in space uh, is fed to the function and that returns a distance to the nearest surface. So. In this two-dimensional case, the distance to the nearest surface is represented by this green line. And then you can use that information to ray march toward the surface. So you can project rays from the AR camera into space, into the virtual space, and take the step distance, the minimum distance to any surface. So you can be guaranteed not to hit any surface. And then you just get smaller and smaller until you're like, okay, cool, that's the surface. And then you can calculate the normals and uh, everything else you need to shade it. Uh, these are great because it's minimal in size, it doesn't require model files, and it has really interesting properties like uh, smooth minimum functions. You can blend between shapes really easily with just a few lines of code. Uh, you can create infinite spaces, uh, so you can do domain repetition in a single line of code. You draw one object, but you're like, oh, I want to see infinite many of these, <laughs> and the render is like, no problem. Uh, so it does that really well. Uh, it handles constructive geometry really elegantly. There are algorithms for mesh-based uh, geometries uh, to do this type of stuff, to subtract a sphere from a cube, for example. But in uh, sign distance fields, it's just as easy as a one line of code. And also in sign distance fields, it's really easy to create non-Euclidean uh, geometries. This is uh, all of space inverted inside of a sphere that's rotating around itself. So you couldn't you couldn't get away with this with the regular mesh. <laughs> so uh, it allows uh, really, really cool rendering techniques. And this is just all it is. Uh, I'm not going to go through this line by line, but this is one of the pieces of code. It's kind of esoteric, but it's really uh, portable. It's just stored as a function pointer in a plist file, and then the plist file automatically populates the UI. And the plist file also contains um, all of the parameters for the fractal as well, and all of the ranges. So that populates the UI sliders, and as you change the sliders, it updates the parameters. 
Um, if you're unfamiliar with plists, they're just a JSON or XML type file that's proprietary to Mac OS. Um, and so, yeah, uh, how do we actually render these things? Um, I'm using metal and I'm using the camera projection and view matrices provided by AR session to project rays into the ray marsh world. And until I find the surface, uh, that until I find the depth in which the ray intersects with, and then I compare that depth with the real world uh, from the LiDAR sensor. And uh, whatever one is closer, I render that. So there's a bit more to it, but that's the essentially, you calculate two depths or you calculate one depth and then you compare it to the real world depth and you render the cone march, uh, the ray march if it's closer. Uh, this has been pretty um, unconventional for many years uh, because it's quite expensive to do this technique because for every pixel of the screen, you actually have to project a ray into space uh, maybe 20, 30, 40 times and then calculate the surface at every step. Uh, so it can get very expensive really fast, especially as high, at high resolutions. So I use a multi-pass cone marching algorithm to start with the texture just uh, three by two, so really small, and then doubling the resolution of the texture each time, uh, reusing the previous depth. So we try to just calculate as much information as we can at a low resolution, and then we fill in the details at the high resolution. And I also use a technique called ray relaxing, which it's kind of complicated, but it just uh, basically, it just over predicts uh, the step length and then it, it checks to see if it missed any space. And um, uh, if you have any questions about that, let me know. I found the term kind of funny, it's ray relaxed. Um, but, and I also terminate the ray march if the ray depth exceeds the world depth. So if you're marching into space, uh, trying to figure out where this fractal is, if you recognize that the depth of the real world that you've already went past, you can you know that the uh, that the sign distance field is already occluded. So you can just bail out of the ray march function and save some computation there. Um, but just plopping these things in the real world, uh, it doesn't really do much uh, in terms of convincing people that these are actually in the space. So one of the ways that I try to bridge the gaps between the dimensions is to add post effects, often based on the depth parameter of the LiDAR scene and the cone march scene combined. These are all controllable with sliders. It, um, uh, the variables are, and they're also defined in the P list, just like the convention with the distance fields. And um, and yeah, these seem to work pretty well. Um, but also, uh, gradients often cause issues with compression. Uh, here's just me walking around outdoors, and uh, it's actually really, really pretty. Uh, in person and crisp, but it, the video doesn't really do it justice. So this using something so chaotic like this would be more applicable in an art gallery installation type environment where you just can actually have the device in their hand. Another way, I, I'm just gonna play this video again because it's uh, the same example, but another way to convince uh, your, the user that they're in this uh, trippy world is that I'm mapping the fractal parameters to the position of the iPad in world space. So as you move the camera around, the fractal changes. You'll see this in later slides too, but it's a really, really interesting way of exploring uh, many different configurations of uh, an infinite space. <laughs> and uh, this is a post effect that I settled on as, uh, or so far as the, uh, as the best example of bridging the two dimensions together. It's just a basic CRT effect that does a little like screen bending and has some scan lines and some film grain uh, combined with the refraction that I'll talk about, I think in the next slide. I, I think it looks um, pretty convincing. Uh, the refraction also uh, is worth its weight in gold. It's like pretty, uh, standard or obligatory in the AR world now. Uh, it's kind of everywhere, but I had to implement it myself. So that was kind of fun. Um, and I think this really um, adds a lot to it. And I've also been experimenting with some linear fog. So 
adding fog to both the Raymarch scene and the real world. So this is just like walking in my apartment in the distance you see um, just a black fog. I can configure that to be any color, but uh, since the fog is applied to both the cone march face and the real world, it kind of feels like they're in the same dimension to some extent. <laughs> it's just erasing the real world so you forget that it's there. And, <laughs> um, but yeah, you can see as you move around the space, the fractal changes and you can kind of go up and it's, it almost feels like performative walking around my apartment, looking at very detailed fractals. So uh, it's pretty, it's a pretty fun experiment. Uh, it's not, I guess, uh, going to be an app for big social change or uh, anything like that, but uh, more of an artistic pursuit. But um, the plans I have for the future is uh, definitely trying to convince the user more that the object is in the space. I'm trying to do Raymark shadows. I wasn't able to get them done for this meetup. I really wanted to because I knew like a lot of smart people were going to be here. Um, so I'm trying to do it by uh, detecting planes via AR kit, sending them to scene kit, and then using the function pointer for the distance field to do Raymark shadows on the planes. So far, I'm only rendering a black texture. I'm not sure what's going on, but hopefully one more weekend of uh, work is going to do it. Um, there's some more renderer improvements I want to do. I want to do a bunch of dithering where there's um, uh, where the data is kind of lower looking resolution. There, parts of it look blocky, and so I want to do dithering between that to uh, better smoothen the gap. I want to send out test flight builds, and I want to also experiment with editing the distance fields uh, from maybe an HTTP server. So have the app open on your iPhone or iPad, and then like have a laptop, open up a web browser, go to some server that the iPad is hosting, and then be able to edit the actual distance field that the iPad is rendering. I think that would be pretty fun just for myself, but I also think that would add a level of usefulness to developers. Like it would become more of an actual playground then. It's not like, hey, come experience the distance fields that I wrote. It's like, oh, I want to act people that write these. There is a huge culture behind, behind this, by the way, like a lot of people, right? Um, I guess th there's a small subculture of like people that write distance fields um, and who probably would be interested in, in um, making their own for this. Otherwise, I think it's a good uh, sandbox for having my own distance fields in an art gallery or something. Like if I wanted to, um, make a standalone version of this. Like I could easily just remove all the UI and just have a fixed distance field scene. Um, also thinking about the app store, I'm not totally sure if I'm gonna get that far, but I'm gonna go until I feel like it's useful enough to release, I guess. And then we'll go from there. And thank you, thank you all so much for uh, watching. And that's it for me. Uh, I think there's the questions. Thank you, Connor. That was incredible and um, really exciting to see projects like that at the meetup. I, I really love to see uh, work like that. And uh, the chat was rolling and everyone seemed really excited. So <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Let's see. Barry, do we yeah, have any you... questions? Yeah, we have some questions here uh, about your test test flight signups. You have a or test flight build. Do you have a sign up or link or, or what uh... after that that you, people can join that? Please just like either email me or DM me on uh, Twitter or Instagram or email me. Uh, I'm just keeping a spreadsheet of people who want to be uh, on the test flight build. So um, that's there's no signups right now. But two weeks ago, I said it was going to be out in two weeks, but it'll probably be another two weeks. Not a problem. We'll, we'll, we won't hold it to you. Um, <laughs> beautiful. So you can send up your uh, your Insta and whatever links you or contact info you like over here. Um, what's the FPS frames per seconds you got while displaying the fractals on LiDAR devices such as the iPhone has? 60. Yeah, 60. 60. Didn't go beyond it. Didn't go below 60 from what I can notice. Yeah. Cool. I think you addressed this a little bit um, about art and such, but uh, what are some of the practical use cases, if any, of this app, or is it just for art? But either um, way, it's amazing that, that they were clear to tell you, tell me. Thanks. Yeah, I think it could be used for educational purposes as well. Um, 
what something you can do with sign distance functions is represent four dimensional surfaces. So potentially you could uh, do some sort of four dimensional education video, or you could do some like sort of fractal education video in wow. three dimensional space. Like, um, and also like Oculus Medium uses a really similar technique. Uh, it's kind of like voxel based and they remerge the voxels. So it can be used like the rendering engine could be adapted to some sort of, uh, I don't know, creative input where you could actually add volumes of, of data to the mesh or to the distance field. Uh, what is it? Mostly, yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I have kids that always ask me, what's the point of math? What's algebra? You know, they, they yeah. just complain about it. And, yeah. you know, I, I really don't have much to say. I mean, I've worked in science my most of my life in, in the business area of it. And yeah, pretty much you don't really use math. I mean, unless you're an engineer or, or R&D person. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, this could be really a cool application. And so a, a follow up, I, I apologize for, you know, I'm, uh, I helped organize this, but I don't know what Oculus Medium is. It's something re regarding the Meta's Oculus. Is it uh, an app? Is it part of the no, device? Yeah, or? it's it's the it's a VR app. Uh, it's like a sculpting app. So you can like use the, I guess the Oculus Touch or the the controllers to uh, like draw in three D space, and it, it like actually draws like a volume mesh, wow. and and you can like sculpt it and everything. It's almost like a bit like clay. There's some tools that, uh, yeah, make it look like clay. I guess. That's awesome. Yeah, so put it out there. If anyone wants to uh, donate Oculus uh, Quest or any device to, to New York AR, we would love it because, I mean, I personally don't. I don't think Andy has one. Um, I mean, you know, we could, we could use it for, for use for the, for the group in, in person. Um, okay, and what other question we got? Uh, I think that's pretty much it unless Andy sees any others. Uh, Caitlin, one more question, Barry. Caitlin wants to know if uh, what would the process be to combine uh, some of these fractal art with music? Oh, yeah. So I've done some tests in the past. Um, oftentimes I will use audio and get what's called or perform what's called a fast Fourier transform on it to create uh, frequency bins of the audio texture so you can kind of see what's going on on the, the frequency spectrum uh, and basically use th those parameters to have effects on the sign distance fields. Typically I use uh, audio effects for post-processing. Um, the most success I've had using audio has actually been timing the audio versus to changes in the the actual space, so the, not the actual audio data itself, but the, the audio timing data is like when the song changes first, when it goes into the chorus, when it dies down from the chorus, stuff like that. I've, I like working with that a lot. It, the data is a lot less noisy, I guess. Um, and yeah, you can really map the energy to the, to the sound better. That reminds me of the of the old uh, players that used to get, and you could you could put these different uh, skins on them. And you probably still can do it in some sort of simulator. Back in the early two thousands, when you'd play like your MP threes, and you could do some visualizations on it on your computer or whatever. Back in the day, if you if you, I don't know, this are, these are for the old people in the audience, I guess, because <laughs> I, I remember those. That was kind of cool. Sounds well, familiar. Uh, one more thing from from Lucy, who's uh, who's a uh, a composer, a musician, um, part of the Chromic duo, um, and she says, "Ooh, so you've composed visuals to match audio, but have you uh, have you ever done it the other way around? Uh, make audio to match the visuals. Make visuals, which yes, I think that make was audio the question. Yeah, yeah." yeah. Um, I have made audio for some visuals before, but uh, nothing I'm overly proud about. <laughs> Usually it's just messing around in Ableton. I find a synth and then add effects until uh, you can't hear much anymore. <laughs> but the, the music is equally experimental as the visuals. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Connor, for joining. It was a pleasure having you on. No worries. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, 
Awesome. So uh, next up, we have uh, um, also Connor. Throw in uh, your, some links to the uh, the chat. I'm sure uh, people oh, for sure. connect with you, uh, your Instagram and whatnot. Um, next up, we have Alone uh, Grinchspoon with us. Um, Alone is the founder and CEO of Echo 3D, a really exciting um, 3D model uh, compression and hosting. It's like an AWS for 3D models, and it's been backed by. Uh, Facebook, now Meta, and GitHub, from what I've seen online, uh, alone received his uh, BSc from, uh, as a double major in computer science and electrical and electronic engineering from Tel Aviv University, specializing in software engineering, uh, computer uh, communication networks, and cybersecurity, he is a, which is very impressive, he's also a Java native speaker, so he, he's a, uh, he spent a lot of hours programming in Java, Android, Unity, C Sharp, C, and Bash, and he loves to create AR, uh, VR apps, and GUI, and graphically design apps, and all the cool stuff AR related. Uh, and we're excited to learn a bit more about Echo 3D and your background alone. So thank you for joining. Thank you so much, Andy, for this introduction. Hey, everyone, really, really great to be here. I'm going to share a screen so you can all see. Um, perfect. Um, so I'm Alon from Echo. We are a cloud platform for 3D applications, which basically means that we provide tools and network infrastructure for creators and developers like yourself to build games, AR, VR applications, and more. Um, I'm going to start by saying hello. So I'm Alon, as Andy mentioned. Um, I did my master's in computer science at Columbia University, uh, specializing in AR, VR, and computer graphics, and my undergrad in Tel Aviv University, specializing in cloud and network infrastructure. So I'm a certified nerd and a big believer in the intersection between kind of 3D and cloud and um, AR and VR. So really, really excited to be here with kind of fellow mind people who love 3D, love AR, love VR, and excited to talk to you and share an interactive demo that you can kind of play around with. So um, as I mentioned, our cloud platform basically allows you to build applications very similar if you think about it, if you're building a website and you're storing images and videos on some remote cloud. Um, so you can drag and drop an image or video somewhere and basically that appears on web and mobile. And if I'm in New York and you're in California and we're both watching an episode on Netflix, we kind of automatically get the best streaming experience. At Echo, we train the, the, these concepts into augmented and virtual reality, basically providing you with a way to manage and deliver 3D data and get the best 3D streaming experience. And today we're going to see how that works. Um, basically, I'm going to share a demo for tech. Um, you can do the same um, after the demonstration. It's really, really easy. You just go to our website, you register for free, completely for free, and then you're able to build AR applications. So let's see how that works in practice. So after you register, um, you're going to get a access to our platform that you're seeing right now. So on the left is our platform, and then the right is just my phone. And when you register, you get this project key. It's basically an API key that allows you to um, manage a project. And you can have multiple projects, basically multiple rep repositories for 3D content. We have different integrations with different um, software platforms like Unity, Java, Swift. I'm sure you've heard a lot about all of these. But basically, these are platforms that, if it's for Android or iOS or um, kind of game engines, allow you to build applications. Um, I'm going to start with something super simple. I'm going to add some content to the cloud. So some 3D content in the form of images, videos, 3D models. Um, you can also use our kind of um, collection of 3D models and search engine to find free 3D models that you can use in your application. Um, so basically, completely for free, you can find like really, really cool um, 3D models. Uh, I'm going to throw in the Empire State Building, kind of following um, Donna as an institute is going to lead of like talking about uh, buildings and construction. So let's throw that in. I'm uploading this building right now. What happens is we take that 3D model, we convert, we compress it, we make sure it works on any device out there. If it's Android, if it's iOS, if it's Magically, if it's a HoloLens, if it's any of the kind of AR VR devices or game engine that you know. Once it's in our platform, we can see it here in 3D. Um, we see that originally it's an OBJ file, but we can actually download it as a GLB or use the Z automatically because our system kind of converted it to that. Um, but let's start with something again, kind of the quick, um, the quickest uh, way to see augmented reality. So I'm going to click this one right here. It will expose a QR code that you can actually scan with your phones right now. So just put your camera in front of it. I'm going to do the same with my phone. It will redirect you to a website. You don't have to install anything. And then you're going to see um, the Empire State Building in augmented reality right now on your phones. So just put your phone in front of this, your camera. It redirects to a website. You don't have to install anything. Um, you're going to see this web page like I'm seeing on my phone. You'll see the Empire State Building. I'm going to click CNAR. Camera opens up. 
I'm ready, I'm able to kind of see um, the, the, the floor, I'm gonna move it a little bit and the Empire State Building just pops up and is literally here next to me, how cool is that? So super, super easy, I'm basically moving around, I can walk around and walk inside, it's super, super simple. Hopefully you're able to do the same with your phones. Again, I'm gonna leave this QR code right here so you can kind of get a few more seconds to kind of scan it, but basically hopefully you'll be able to see it on your phones. Again, you don't have to install anything, just open a web browser, see, click CNAR, and the Empire State Building should be visible. So that is a quick kind of example of how we can kind of see augmented reality um, with Echo. So that uh, through websites. Another example um, is mobile applications. So if I'm gonna open this um, sample mobile app right here, um, if I plug in the same project here, let's do that. So same one that we have in the console, it will stream the data from the cloud to the device. And again, no surprises, we're gonna see the same kind of building uh, appear in real time through a mobile app as opposed to a website that we saw earlier. Yeah, should appear somewhere around here, there we go, perfect. Okay, so we saw web, we saw mobile. Another example I wanna show you all is Unity. So it's a game engine a lot of developers love to use to build air VR applications. Um, so let me open it right here. I'm gonna plug in the same key. We have an empty VR scene, just a 3D space with nothing in it. I'm gonna plug in that um, kind of key and then data will stream from the cloud to the game engine. So we already saw how we can kind of upload something to Echo, see it in web, then see it in mobile. Now we're gonna see how that works in um, a game engine. And there you go, the Empire State Building is automatically visible. How cool is that? So everything streams from the cloud under the hood, we kind of make sure to optimize all the servers, all the kind of network startup, but all you have to do is literally drag it off the data bottle, it's not like it works everywhere. If you wanna change something, so let's say I wanna update this 3D environment and I don't know, change the model so we'll animate a little bit, I'll just add some metadata, for example, direction equals right, bam, suddenly it starts to rotate in real time. If I want to build a city and I want to add more and more models, let's throw in another building. Maybe I'll, I'll move this around. I can basically upload more and more content to Echo and it will automatically be available um, to stream. So I just uploaded some new content and bam, suddenly it appears in the game engine. Super cool, right? And again, minimal effort from my end. I just need to upload it um, and it just works. Um, I can share the, these models with you as well. Every 3D asset has like these chart codes that you can scan and see all of them in 3D. Um, we have kind of branded links that basically direct you directly to, the, to the, the 3D model. So you can kind of share them on social media and whatnot and see things in augmented reality really, really quickly. Um, um, we can also upload images and videos. So maybe I'll show you how that works as well. Maybe I'm, I'm gonna upload some um, video. So let's upload a video or yeah, there you go. So same process occurs, but now we're just using an MP4 file. We take that video, we convert it, we compress it, so it'll work in any kind of VR platform out there. Um, great, so we saw mobile, we saw web, we saw Unity, um, but everything we saw so far was really around um, kind of um, really around surface, um, surface um, recognition. So basically the camera recognizes the floor and it overlays that, um, wait, let me pop this again. It overlays the 3D model um, on top of the floor. Another example of augmented reality that I want to show you all. Let me see if I can restart the mirroring. Um, is image recognition. So basically, we can, can scan a, a QR code and see the 3D model on top of in a uh, on top of an image. Give me one sec to reconnect the streaming. Hopefully that will work. No, that's okay. Up at this point, we can see the video streaming in the game engine as well. So super, super cool stuff. And again, it just was added and automatically it jumps into the screen. Perfect. So now um, let's go back here. Just gonna move this somehow. Wait, how do I? Mm -hmm. Give me one sec, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna click this button right here. And now instead of doing C on the floor, I'm gonna do C on an image. So if anyone wants, they can scan this QR code with me again live. You don't have to install anything. This will redirect again to a website, but now instead of 
um, the augmented reality kind of um, computer vision recognizing the floor, it will try to recognize an image. At this point, the image is the QR code. And then we should be able to see the Empire State Building kind of pop up. Um, try this with your phones as well. Just put your phone in front of the QR code. It should basically detect um, the image and overlay that with the, with the uh, Empire State Building. Uh, another example I can show is the uh, basically face recognition. Let's see if that works. Phone is a bit slower with the casting and everything. Yeah, there you go. And hopefully, yeah, the, com the camera opens up. I can't see the 3D model for a sec, but that's fine. Basically, try that with your phones as well, and you should should work on your end. I think for mine, like the computer is is a bit slow. It looks good on my end. Love it, love it. Yeah, try just kind of to scan it, and it will just pop up in front of you. So I'm going to leave these um, kind of these things around here, so you can kind of play around with them as well. Okay, so what we saw so far. So we know how to upload content. We know how to stream it down to kind of different applications. Um, we saw all these different integrations. What other things that you can do with Echo? So obviously you can switch a theme, which is cool, dark being the kind of default. Um, but other things that you can do is basically kind of explore different resources. So our documentation or different example projects I'm gonna review in a sec. Um, you can control data, you can control locations. So if you put different um, kind of assets around the world, you can create an application that if you open it in New York, you're gonna see the Empire State Building, but if you open it in San Francisco, you're gonna see the Golden Gate Bridge. You can see all the kind of distribution of users and all these kind of servers that are supporting your application. You can uh, monitor the security of your application, see some insights around how your data is doing. So if you're building an app in augmented reality and you wanna see, well, let's say I visualize couches, I can see that the green couch is more popular than the red couch, I can sell more green couches. And you can see how users are interacting with your content. Um, as I mentioned again, you can see a distribution of content, you can convert and compress assets. So let's say I want this um, 3D model reduced by 50%, I can do that. It basically decimates the model automatically from our cloud. I can change things in real time. So let's say Christmas is coming up or in our case Thanksgiving, and we want to change um, the 3D model to basically reflect the, I don't know, the, the holiday that's coming up. So instead of rebuilding the application, you can literally change the colors and textures right in the console and that will reflect in your application as well. Um, and the customized page is a cool page. You can basically overlay buttons in the web AR experience, you basically um, add buttons like buy now, um, or kind of um, direct to your website or add a logo and stuff like that, add a camera capture, really, really cool stuff. Last features I want to show you is some of our tutorials, basically open source tutorials that allow you to build applications with Echo and build really, really cool stuff. Everything is open source, everything is free that you can literally start building right now if you want to build something like a game or a wall art, or here's one of our engineer building a makeup tutorial. So really, really cool stuff around kind of data visualization and training and, and, and really cool, compelling use cases. The last page that I want to show you is our inspiration page. It is filled with amazing examples of all of our community of developers. Today, we have over 12,000 developers um, on our platform for building applications for gaming and data visualization and training. Um, really, really cool, compelling stuff. For example, here's this NFT marketplace that uses Echo to kind of try before you buy an NFT. Um, and they did like eight successful drops. The three that they did with AR were sold out in like 30 minutes. Really, really cool stuff. Here's the murder mystery game that uses Echo to basically create a really compelling multiplayer game. And again, there's really amazing things here that use surface detection, image detection, um, face recognition. Um, here's a um, kind of uh, face kind of face filter for COVID that someone built. So really go through this list to get inspired of what people are building in augmented reality and how they're leveraging Echo basically create really cool scalable applications. Because again, the fact is that you can build a really cool app, but then if it doesn't change, users will not come back. But with Echo, you can literally constantly add new content, change content, and that basically means that your application will be super, super dynamic. Um, I'm gonna go back to the slides, sum up a little bit, and then um, answer any questions. So let's recap. So what we see so far, so we saw how developers can use any platform, if it's Android, iOS, Magically Pollens, whatever. We saw how content creators can basically add content with no technical skills. And we saw how you can basically use Echo to build, store, and deliver 3D assets to all these different platforms. We saw web, we saw mobile, uh, we saw Unity, we saw face filters, we saw um, image recognition, anything. Um, we enable use cases. So we talked about, like we saw the inspiration page that's kind of filled with amazing examples of augmented virtual reality. Um, around ads and tourism and shopping and all of these things, again, you're limited only by imagination. You can build really, really compelling stuff and use Echo to basically stream your data. 
Um, a little bit more about our company. We raised over $4 million through venture capital uh, firms uh, like Convoy Ventures, Imagine Ventures, and Space Capital. Uh, got investors from Techstars and Y Combinator and Verizon. I won a bunch of awards and some Venegi metrics, uh, but we are trying to be there for every kind of major tech event, major major event that focuses on creators and developers. So if you see our team at some event, um, now that events are kind of you know going back to normal in some capacity, um, definitely say hello. Make sure to register for free on our website for a free um, kind of account and start doing exactly what I just did. Upload content, see it in augmented reality, share it with your friends, really build something really, really cool. I think it took less than, what, 15 seconds to kind of see something in augmented reality through scanning a QR code or sharing a link. Um, thank you so much for the organizers for inviting me. Super happy to kind of speak with you all and kind of be part of this community. And if anyone has any questions, I'd love to answer them. So maybe I'll jump back to the chat. Mm -hmm and see what we have here. That was awesome, Alone. Uh, Barry, if you uh, have any questions. Oh, well, I mean, Alone, if he wants to, he could go for himself or that. I, don't any, I mean, I have some, but if you want to go for the questions first in the chat, go for it, and then we can uh, do some others that, that we've compiled. Yeah, definitely. I definitely ran through a lot of things. Um, so um, if you have any questions, let me just kind of scroll back um, here. Can I ask you one alone? Yes, please. So is it, um, so the Unity integration, does that work for entire Unity projects or is it just for the 3D models on the project? I apologize if I missed that. So you can add as many models as you want for your entire project. So you can basically have all the assets that you have in your Unity build, put them on the cloud, and then basically make a, let's say 70 megabyte build kind of in Unity become seven megabytes because all the assets are gone. Um, and when you open the application, then they stream from the cloud. This means that when you publish an application, it's going to be super, super small and more likely for people to download it because it's much, um, much more compact, basically. Brilliant. Great, great question. Um, any other questions in the chat? Yeah, David just... Rose had a question about, uh, can you spatially anchor these models? Yes. Oh, so something I didn't show, maybe I should have, let me show it to you here. Um, maybe I'll share a screen again, just to show it to you guys. Um, so when you upload content to Echo, you can actually um, put it on a specific location. So I can say that I want this box to be in New York. And then I'll basically anchor it to a specific GPS coordinate, with specific radius. And then when I upload it to Echo, um, I can add multiple kind of assets and, and basically say when the application opens in um, New York, let's do Canada. Um, when it opens in New York, I'll see some type of content. When I'll open it in Canada, I'll see some other content. Um, and this basically allows you to create from one application, basically make it location-based and kind of a Pokemon Go style experience. So great, great question. Would, would that configure the Unity project to like to launch the, the model in that specific location? How does that tie and work if it's part of a larger project? Yeah, so in our Unity SDK, you can basically query um, with the device itself for like its GPS coordinates and then send that to the cloud when you're asking for content. And then it will basically return just the relevant content um, based on the location. Um, super easy, you can send GPS coordinates, you can send um, just locations like I did, like New York, and we'll convert that to a GPS coordinate. Um, both options kind of exist. And the same applies for web AR. So you can kind of query for a specific model and then only get the ones that reside around you basically. Incredible. A uh, question from Kyle, what render pipelines are supported for Unity? Um, I mean, anything, like at the end, Echo just kind of streams the model to you. If you want to use any shader, any rendering pipeline, we're not replacing any process that you're going to kind of you do with Unity. At the end, we're not replacing the renderer, we're just replacing the way that you kind of manage content. Um, and the same applies for kind of Android and iOS. Um, if you want to use kind of the built-in renderers, you can do that. You can use any shader, like anything, anything is, you're not, we're not trying to kind of disrupt your rendering uh, process, but more your content kind of management and delivery process, if that makes sense. Does it, uh, you guys, do you guys support animations as well? on the platform? Yes, um, I didn't show that, but I can actually upload like just pre-animated 3D models. They're also supported, super easy. Uh, let's see if I have something here. Um, and then they'll also support them the same apply. If you scan a care code, you'll just see them animated. And you can, I think, cycle between animations by clicking. So I've been reading a bit about the USD, USD and USDZ file format. Do you guys support the uh, those as well? Mm -hmm. So check this out. So when we upload the skyscraper, if I want to download it, automatically it has its USB-C conversion and 
a file under the hood, uh, just for kind of everyone, USDC is kind of the only file format that is supported on iOS. So if you want 3D assets to work on iOS natively, you'll have to use the USDC file. And if you don't have the USDC file, just upload your file stack out and we'll automatically generate it for you. Um, here you go. Here's an example. Like we, I just uploaded the GLB file automatically. It converted to all these different file formats and USDC is one of them. Uh, for the one who asked about animations, you can scan this and see the animated model. I'm going to leave it here. Um, oh wait, and maybe I'll also um, share it with you. So I just uploaded an animated model. And if I go to its link um, on the web, I'll be able to see it right here. So let's check it out. There we go. Hmm, that's awesome. And we'll, uh, we'll close with one final question from David Rose. Uh, can you compare how your tool optimizes models versus Sketchfab? Yeah, so Sketchfab is more about kind of a content aggregator. So we actually have integrations with Sketchfab. So like, for example, when you look for upload kind of models to upload, you can actually find models directly from Sketchfab. Um, they do some compressions, but we kind of, on top of their compression, we do another one. Um, so it's, again, it's kind of a complementary service as opposed to kind of um, a competitive one. Um, so if you get something from Sketchfab, we'll probably get the best version that they have and then apply our conversion on top of it. So it will actually become better. Um, but yeah, you can leverage our search engine to literally, you know, grab files directly from Sketchfab. Amazing. Thank you so much, Alon, for joining. Definitely. Thank you so much for having me. I uh, hope people enjoyed and um, start building. Like this is definitely the time to build 3D AR VR applications. Um, specifically now when we're so kind of disconnected, I think 3D and AR can really bring us together. Um, so thanks again for that invite, Andy. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Alon. Awesome having you. Thank you, everyone, for joining New York Augmented Reality. Uh, Alon, if you're still there, just one more question. Um, yeah, that's it. From Rob, apologize if you covered this already, but do you support multi-user simultaneous user experience? Yes. So you can have multiple users looking at the exact same thing and you can literally synchronize them from the cloud. So the same way I added like a metadata that says this model needs to rotate now, you can do the same thing from the user perspective and have one user decide that this rotates and then it kind of synchronizes for all the other users. And basically through the cloud, you can kind of say, um, you can basically broadcast data to everyone. Um, so 100% yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. Appreciate everyone joining uh, New York Augmented Reality. Uh, I'll keep the uh, video going and the meetup open for a few more minutes, and then uh, we'll close off and call it a night. Feel free to post your social links alone. Thanks for uh, sharing the registration link. I put your link in there as well um, so people can follow up with you. OK, cool. Sweet. Thanks so much, Alon, for joining. A really awesome demo and, and uh, pumpkin. Yeah, definitely. And let me share another link um, specifically for Thanksgiving. Um, here's a link to see a turkey and AR. Oh, cool. I'll check it out. There it is. It's a, low poly, it's a low poly turkey. That's how I like them. <laughs> it takes less time to roast. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron, for joining. Good to have you here. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And with that, we'll call it a night. We really appreciate you being here to support and learn from New York Augmented Reality. So thank you so much. Thank you, Andy, for organizing this amazing event. Thanks, Barry. Have a good one. Happy birthday. Thank you. Oh, happy birthday. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you, David. It was, it's always a pleasure having you on, David. You're, uh, yeah, you're thanks great. for inviting me. Doing great, thanks. Thanks, David. Yeah, thank you. I love the fractals, man. That's that's awesome. Oh, the city planning is also fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for being part of it. I look forward to reading your book and I'll leave a review without a doubt. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Awesome. Thanks, guys.